So to kick it off, I'd love to just get an understanding of at what point in your career did you kind of have an aha moment that brand is something that is really important and that you need to focus on? And the reason I ask that is because for most B2B marketers, brand is the last thing that they typically think about and would focus on because the CEO is typically super focused on measurable results. And in most companies, brand is something that you can't really measure. And so I'm curious, was there some experience you had or something that you did that kind of led to a, a focus on brand marketing? For me, it was at, it was at Drift, um, which is where I, I worked prior to this, because we were, it was like, it was 2015, and we were building a sales and marketing SaaS company, like another one of the 10,000, you know, in the mar- marketing tech landscape. And it was just a, a big decision from, a wise decision from the founders, David and Elias, to bet on brand early, because they knew that even if we did build the best product like spec wise on paper, no one's going to believe that. Right. And, and like the way that people actually buy is through brands and through friends, um, is through brands and through friends. And so like the bet that we made was that brand was going to be the differentiator brand was going to be the thing that was going to earn us the right to have a conversation about our product with someone versus like, if we just came out and we said, Hey, this is, better than intercom, it's faster, it's, you know, blah, 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 you know, better than this, better than that. Like, even if that's true, nobody's going to believe it. Like, I always say, like, if you go to Product Hunt and you just scroll through new products, like the first or second comment on every new product on Product Hunt is like, yeah, this sounds cool, but how is this different than blank, right? Yeah. And, and everyone, like, I'm sure you guys do it too. Like, well, why should I go with your agency? Like, it, it's everyone's product or service today is a commodity because it's now 2020. It's easier than ever to start a business, a product, uh, build anything. Um, and so like the way that we competed, um, was on brand. And that was just such like a, an eye opening experience for me that like now I couldn't picture doing marketing any other way. Uh, especially it's a huge opportunity to me in B2B marketing. She's fine. Nobody's doing, nobody's doing it. And so like, it's, it's, it's like, I think marketing is all about finding the opportunities and the gaps. Uh, And so like, if you walk into B2B and nobody's investing in brand, then like, holy shit, the huge opportunity for me is to come in and invest in brand. Like, and and so I've seen that be a differentiator. And then the cool part was I got to feel this again when I, when I went to Privy, which is a company that's been around for eight years, uh, about 10 million in revenue, have 500,000 e-commerce merchants using the platform but the company didn't really have like a a strong brand. And so like this time around, I had the opposite thing, which is like get to build a brand on top of something that already exists. Um, And and I'm already seeing how that has had an impact on, on, you know, our organic traffic and, and just word of mouth. And there's so many things with a brand that like you can't quantify, but I, and I, I drives me nuts when somebody like comments on a post about like, well, how do you know? You just know, like use your gut. You just know, like you can walk into a restaurant and just something feels like this place is going to be the right place. Like this place is going to be legit. Like you have that feeling. And the same is true with a brand. Um, And the way that I can tell is like, people are proud to work at that company. They want to share your stuff. They're, they're sharing, they're commenting on things. They're telling their friends, they're wearing the t-shirts. Like there's just a certain element to a brand that, that, that makes everything as you do as a company um, easier. And I also think the other fail failure on B2B on B2B's part is like B2B has typically just been very like isolated. Like we only think about B2B. Like I am a B2B company. I can only look at, you know, Salesforce and service now as like my inspiration where um, marketing is just about understanding people and understanding how people make decisions. And like, you know, everything between work and life and and brands has blended because of the internet and smartphones. And so like everyone's just constantly a consumer. And so you can't have this like fragmented experience where you might buy something from a consumer company and it's an awesome experience and they send you a really fun box and you get a really great welcome email series and the unboxing experiences is great and you get videos and whatever. And then you go buy B2B software and it's terrible. Um, The opportunity is to appeal to like how people are already you know, interacting, like, why not make your, why can't your B2B company feel like Nike, feel like Lululemon, feel like, you know, a B2C company? 
why can't? And then I think that's just because those are just false beliefs that, that, that marketers have had um, because that you have CEOs who oftentimes don't really understand the value of marketing. And so that's why you're getting all those questions. Like we never once at Drift were like, let's, we need to quantify the value of the brand. That's because David, the CEO was like, I know it, I, I can feel it. I don't, I don't need to you know, give Dave 15 metrics that we need to try to track in marketing. Like you can feel it every single day. Um, so I don't know if Benji wanted to take this in a different direction, but I, so, so, so this is great. And I'd love to use your story of drift. So you get to drift. They're like, you said that it was because the founders understood the importance. And so that was the experience. And I, I immediately want to be like, and so like, how do you, what do you do? How do you do this? <laughs> Cause it's relevant for everyone. It's relevant for us. I think somehow in grow and convert, to be honest, we, we stumbled backwards into a brand, which is amazing. And I have another agency that has no brand, no authority, nothing. And so I, I've seen the contrast firsthand. And I think a lot of people in Grow and Convert members in our community is going to want to know this. So like, so, so what do you do? And maybe you could tell that in the context of what you did at Drift. So you got in there and they were like, Dave, brand is really important. And then, or maybe the first place to start is just, what do you define as brand? Yeah, so, so I think... I don't have the perfect like one line or definition of a brand, but I think like, I think that, I think what people make the mistake of is that they think that brand means colors, design, logo, website. And so like, okay, like you, you take, you got a new company, like you got to go work on the brand. That means I got to go like redesign the website. And no, it's not that. Like, I think that, I think that to me, a brand is, a brand is really like, creating a relationship with, with potential customers uh, in a way that goes beyond um, your product, right? It's not a transactional relationship. It, a brand is like, I might listen to your podcasts and watch all your videos, even though I'm, I'm not going to buy your product right now. And like that, that's what you, that's what we, we saw. We saw people who would be like listening to our podcasts and watching our videos and doing whatever at Drift. And they're like, Hey, I'm 21. I'm an intern at this company. Like I have no buying power but that person is addicted to our content. And guess what? When they do go buy in four or five years, they're going to buy, buy from us. And so I think to me, the number one way that you can build a brand today is to think of like your company as a media company. And you need to create all of the assets that like a media company would have in order to build a relationship with, with people. And so like for me, the, the secret way to build a brand has actually been through a podcast. And the reason that I love podcasting is not even because um, it's not because it's like this huge channel that you can get to millions of listeners. Cause for most people, like a couple hundred downloads a month is going to be pretty much the max of your podcast. But I love a podcast because it's like, it's a super um, flexible form of, of content where like you can just record everything and it gives you so much leverage from a brand standpoint. So like this interview could be video clips it could be a uh, blog post, you know, you could probably come up with three or four different blog posts that you could write just based on this one, you know, Pete, like 40 minute, whatever in interview of audio that we do. And so like the way to build a brand for me has been to think about being a media company and starting, starting some type of content, having an email list, actually having an audience that you can, that you can build and grow and, and, and market to not necessarily just coming in and like switching up the logo um, it's actually, it's giving a, giving people a reason to follow your stuff other than this transactional relationship that you're going to have. I, I think you're talking a lot about tactics though. And I'm curious more of the strategy that goes behind the tactics. So when you're coming into a new company and, and let's say you're coming into a super commoditized space, there's hundreds of other products that do the exact same thing. I'm curious how you're thinking about positioning the product or differentiating from all the other competitors out there because I think that's a key thing so I think tactically then then you can go to the podcast and talk about these things or you can create content that shows how it's different but I'm curious like the step before that what's your thought process on, on the strategy about how to how to differentiate the brand from everyone else yeah so so it start so so it's interesting. Most people never talk about the tactics. I'm getting penalized for that. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, but I think it, 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 so. So so you're right. So if you back it all the way up, it starts with the story, 
it starts, it starts with a story. And I love this term from Andy Raskin called the strategic narrative because it's so much more than positioning and messaging. Like, you know, positioning and messaging is, is features and benefits. That's easy. The strategic narrative is thinking about, okay, where do we fit in this like puzzle of all of the potential things that people could use? And that has to come from the CEO uh, who is involved in shaping that. And so like, you're never gonna be able to build a brand or do great marketing unless you, you have something interesting to say as a company. And usually if you don't have something interesting to say as a company, that comes down to the CEO because that has to be, that has to be the part of the CEO's job, right? Just like hiring, just like recruiting, just like fundraising, like the overall company story is the CEO's job. And if you look at people who are great at this, uh, David Cancel at Drift, Brian Halligan at HubSpot, Mark Benioff at Salesforce, like they are embedded in marketing. They, they are telling that story. They're giving the keynote. And so like you have to have something clear to say that has to come from the CEO. Now, the way to go find something to say is you have to like, I would hope that if you're starting this company, there's a reason why. Right. You didn't just roll out of bed and like, you know what? I want to start a drop shipping hoodie company. Like it's going to be tougher to come up with that. Why there? And so like most of the time you hope that that's embedded. And so for me, it was like in the interview process with the founders at drift, like, Oh yeah, these guys really do care about this problem. They have a unique take on this. I'm going to be the one to come and help amplify this and, and, and tell it to the world. Uh, and we spent so much time in the early days of the company just riffing on the messaging every single day, going back and forth. I think this is our wedge. Okay, let's go try to do cold outreach to 50 people. Wait, what, like what was it? Going. What was it adrift? What was the why? So, so, so the why was this whole concept that like the way that you do traditional B2B sales and marketing is broken, where we live in a world that's on demand, that you can get anything now, except in order to buy from a business, you gotta go to a website, fill out a form, get endless follow-up from a BDR, it be in someone's terrible nurture flow for 15 weeks, you know, get hammered with phone calls, download a, a PDF, white paper, whatever, and ultimately buy. And so we positioned like, we made the enemy, not a competitor, not a company, we made the enemy forms, like lead forms. And so we, we told this story that got all these marketers from all over to say like, I don't know what Drift is, but like this speaks to me as a marketer. Cause we were like, hey marketers, we know you don't want to do this either. You, and, and people are like, yeah, you're right. There has to be a better way. And so like, we, we know like, okay, at the end of the day, we're selling software. So this is a little bit of a stretch, but like we gave people hope, right? We gave marketers like hope for doing something better, for doing it the right way, for doing, you know, you know we, we, we try to tap into that emotion of like, you know, there's gotta be a better way. Like you're at home, you buy from Amazon and it's frictionless. You, you watch Netflix and it's frictionless. You can, I can send you guys food after this as a thank you in two seconds on my phone, but I can't go buy your $200 a month SaaS product without, you know, having to talk to someone for four hours. Like that's ridiculous. And so we, we, we made this, like we, we basically forced people to pick a side and we said either you're for forms or you're against them. And then like all of our marketing and the, and the, and the, the, the tactics came around, like, how do we tell that story that, that no forms story over and over, we, we created that enemy, like we created that shared enemy and the enemy can be like the status quo, right? It can be, Hey, you want to get in the best shape of your life. And the enemy is like the prior, you know, previous you, right. Um, or it can be, if you really have the guts, you could call out a specific competitor and just hammer on like the, this is the incumbent and we're just going to go nuts and we're just going to go after these people. Like that would be a great strategy, but a lot of people just don't have the, the stomach for that. Um, you could create some type of shared enemy like forms like we did. Um, and that really draw that, that drives the whole story. And then everything that you do as a company from a positioning and messaging standpoint actually becomes easier because you have that like beacon, you have that like, okay, well, where does this fit within that framework? And so for, for, for Drift, it was conversational marketing. And so every product that we launched after that had to have some spin, some angle for like, how does this tie back into that story, right? HubSpot is inbound marketing. And so everything that they did had to be like, okay, this is our new product that's gonna fit inside of this inbound marketing narrative. It starts with, with like having that clear and compelling narrative as a company. And by the way, it's usually not the narrative that you think it is. It's like, we, we created a, a faster and easier to use CMS for your website. Like everyone's yeah. going to try to win on features. It's like, we, I, I think that, I think that 
you don't want to play in the feature game. Like if you're playing in the feature game, you're, you're not going to win um, because it's just going to take you so long to catch up. And so if you're, if you're a new company coming into a space, unless you have some, some miracle, um, you're very rarely going to be like better out the gate. And even if you are better, nobody's going to believe you. Who's going to believe this new company with no reviews, no social proof, nothing, no friends that have ever bought it and they have the better product. And so we tried to win by, by telling that story. Like, Hey, what's your pitch? My pitch is that we're the only marketing platform that's built for the next generation of marketers. Okay. Well, how is that true? Well, because do you hate lead forms? Yeah, I do. Okay. Well, here's how this works. Like it just, it lets you have that conversation on a different level at Privy. Another example, um, we just recently repositioned the company to just be dead simple. The, the number one thing that Privy owns, we, we, the number one thing that, that we want people to own in, 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 in their mind is Privy equals sales. And so before Privy would be like, hey, this is a, it's a pop-up tool for your Shopify website. Um, you can send emails, you can do other stuff. But the wedge that we found was, wait a second, we have like way more reviews than any other app on Shopify. And uh, by the way, like we actually have the number one app in the sales category. And so our wedge is, hey, what's Privy? Oh, Privy's the number one sales app on Shopify. Does that sound good to you? Like you don't have to know about features to any, yeah, any e-commerce right. founder is going to want to have, okay, well, tell me more. And I think like instead of having to chalk up your, your story into like the everything pitch, the only goal of that should be to get people to say like, sounds interesting, tell me more. And so then that's interesting because there's no enemy all. in that one. That's not an enemy based one. No, there, there's not an enemy, but, but, the, but the, the, the old way, new way, like the status quo is like before Privy, you struggled to get sales on your, on your website. Like you should use the number one sales app so you can sell more stuff online. Mm. Yeah, that's cool. What, so uh, Benji, I'd love to ask uh, sure. Privy. I was going to ask it. That's why I had this tab ready. I'd love to just kind of do these little mini case studies with Dave. Like what about this company? Uh, unless you want to take this in a different direction. So I'd like, I'd love to go back to drift um, and ask the, the, the context of drift versus the other well-known competitor, of course, intercom, both historically, when were they founded? Was it the same time? Cause it seems like this is one of those situations where there's these two major players in front. And I'm going to speak in a total feature way, Dave. So apologies, like in like a, you know, live chat <laughs> space but like you guys have built this sort of brand around it like how, did those discussions happen are you able to, to talk about it like I'm curious if you were just like they're they're creating you know they're going it they're positioning in this way we're gonna go conversational marketing platform or, or was this just like we don't care who there is whether there's one big player like them or a million this is what we're doing how, can you speak to that at all yeah, no, we, we, we had a wedge. We had a wedge in that like David and Elias, the founders of Drift were two guys that built, basically built the product at HubSpot. David was a chief product officer and uh, Elias was the VP of engineering. And they had kind of really, they've done four or five companies and they've only been in marketing and sales software. Whereas mm -hmm. Intercom has kind of been, was kind of born out of like designers and product managers. A lot of their content was around that. And so we said, look, we're going to go all in on, on revenue, right? So, Hey, if you want chat, that's going to drive sales and marketing revenue. Like we are the first company that's focusing hundred percent on chat for sales and marketing. And that, that was the truth. And that was the wedge. Um, and so, so that made it easy. It's like, Hey, what's the difference between inter drift and intercom? Well, what do you want to use it for? Uh, I want to like, do you want to book more meetings for your sales team? Then, then you should go with drift. Cause that's what we're building this for. And by the way, we have this track record with our founders and, and that, that kind of backed up the whole story. So yeah, hundred percent. We, that, that was the wedge that we went after. And is that, and is that despite technically speaking, you, you could do that with intercom or was that actually also product differentiated? Like you, you, you couldn't book meetings if this is more um, like some of it, product. some of it, but, but, but like the whole, the whole roadmap, the whole product roadmap was then, was then based on that strategy. Okay. So if we want to live that, what does that mean? Well, we got to have a better Salesforce integration. We got to give different targeting. And so like, it, it was a little bit of both. Some of it was like, sure, you could maybe hack your way to do that in intercom, but we, like the, the, the strategy, like from, from a, what we're going to build in the, when the company was like 10 people was what are the things that are going to make that claim true? Did, did you have the product differentiation first? Yeah, we, 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 we had like, yeah, we, we were the, like, this is how, this is how drift came to, 
came to have bots, which is like, hey, we realized that live chat wasn't scaling for people in sales. And so we added some like, you know, really, really basic, like, you know, some, some basic bot features in the early days. And that's when things just absolutely blew up. And, and so like it, it was through that learning and that, that's an example of how that strategic narrative dr drives the whole company. Like every week we were coming up with new ideas to, to try to test and, and, and live into like, what if we build a better Marketo integration? What if we get tighter with this thing? What if we go deeper on Salesforce? What if we focus on account-based marketing? Like all these things that, that demand gen marketing teams were doing, like, and we're a smaller team. We just could get quicker to the punch than, than all of those things and then really create, create that wedge of, of sales and marketing. And through that, then you, get, then you get case studies and testimonials and examples. And then like over time, it becomes like clear that, oh yeah, this is for sales and marketing. Adrift, I'm curious how you knew that that was the one thing that you should focus on. So it, so it sounds like there were a couple different things. It was the old way versus the new way. So it was the forms versus the live chat. But then it also sounds like from a differentiation standpoint against competitors, there was also, or we're sales. the best product for this segment of people yeah. as well. And so it was combining both of those things together. Forms are broken and this is a better way to do this. And now we're competing with Intercom and some of these other players that kind of have that same belief system. But then to further differentiate from all those people, now it's, we're going to be the best product for this specific group of people. And I'm curious, beyond the product side, was there anything that led you to focus on that, specifically the sales and marketing use case? Yeah, like the, the, the response to everything that we did, the response to all of our content, the response to emails, the response to podcasts, like you would just see people responding to content emails, like, hey, here's a new blog post, we sent it out. Like, getting personal emails from marketing managers at companies who are like, Oh my God, this is true. I need this. Uh, I've been saying this forever. I'm totally with you. And like, before we really even sold our product, we had built up an audience. And so I, I joined it. I joined at a time where we were still six, eight months before, like before really publicly, our product was publicly available. And the reason they brought me on was to build an audience so that when we launched, we actually had something. And so like, for the first four or five months, all we did was focus on, you know, like I actually think this is how you and I originally got connected. This was like in the, in, you know, inbound.org and growth hackers days, like which content can we get that's gonna get to the top of inbound.org? Like that's what fueled this, this movement it was content first. And so through our audience, we learned what topics were really resonating with people. And then we built a relationship with them because they liked our stuff. And then we got to say, hey, by the way, you know how you've been on our email list for six months now and you've been liking our content? good news. I actually have something for you today, introducing blah. And so like the, the best thing that we did was, was be able to build an audience before we launched. And so then we could actually, we could actually go and do that. And so then, you know, we've already started telling this story and, 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 and have this narrative out there before we even had a product to go with it. Um, so I'd love to talk about theoretically doing this um, for a couple of different company types. So we then, so we, so both Privy, Drift, um, are in kind of the B2B SaaS realm, right? So services. So, so I mentioned, I have these two agencies and Grow and Convert has stumbled in a brand. The Grow and Convert um, thing is a very enemy type story that you mentioned. It's like most content marketing is this uh, hard, hard, it doesn't get any results. People just publish these blog posts. They do nothing. No one's measuring anything. Um, and it's not working. And at Grown Convert, we're talking about strategies and we have an agency, which we only had two years into it, right? Um, that fixes that. I'd love to use this theoretical example. I think a lot of people in the community, they have a, like a solopreneur service business, but it's very me too. So let's use a really prototypical one, which is like a dev agency. They're like, we like, you know, we, we have this dev agency, we have a bunch of developers, we've had some clients through word of mouth so far. And they've either come to us or through the course or services like we want to use content, we want to scale and we develop like, let's just say for sake of argument, like we build, you know, really good like apps, like web hosted apps or like mobile apps or something like that. And we've noticed a lot of their websites and all, it's all the same me too. It'll be like, you know what we do? We do it from start to finish, from design to execution. And you're just like, no, that's not, every single competitor says the same thing. 
so like what what is it like so if you approach the situation like that how, how do you how would you go about sussing out like yeah. something to differentiate from a brand perspective well for, I, in that world i would clean up because it's all developers marketing trying to market <laughs> developers <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so how <laughs> So I think, I think the most important part is, is, is the first part that you mentioned was like, first you have to do an assessment of the landscape. Cause like, I can't tell you what the strategy would be until I looked at everybody else. Because in that world, I might not need a feature. That world I could just have, in that case, I could have the coolest brand. I could have the only website that actually has videos of me. My branding is better. I look more professional. I'm the only one of those people that's actually doing content marketing. And I have a newsletter that I send out every Tuesday morning that I give you like, you know, insider tips to like, so you can feel like, wow, this person really knows his stuff. Like, um, what, one thing that I, one thing that I, that I think is really important in those businesses is like, you, you need to be the face of that business. And so in a world where like, usually this is like a lot of intro, introverted developers, um, who are not going to get out there, I would say, okay, cool. I'm going to walk and talk and do videos with me and I'm going to document everything I'm doing. And I'm going to show that I am living this and I'm really doing this for clients and I'm really getting results and it's real just that alone is going to make me stand out. That's so I don't interesting. Need a, so you're saying, you're saying that that could happen. What you didn't say is the most interesting. There's no enemy there, right? In what you said, you don't even need one. You didn't need, what was the other one? The, the non-enemy one was. Um, old way, like, new way. Yeah. The old way, new way, the privy number one sales app. You're saying you, you may not even need that. Yeah. You, you don't need that. You don't always need that. Like this is, that's an example where like, we just overthink, like we overthink it. We need some silver bullet where like the actual silver bullet is to just do, do marketing. Like you could win by being better at marketing. And I think everybody today wants to work with people that they know, like, and trust. And so if I'm in an industry where not a single person has a blog or is making videos or has a podcast, like I'll give you another example. My, my, my father-in-law is a, is a carpenter. He's 65 years old. He has a nice business. But if I like said, Hey, let me run your business for six months. I could get him more clients and he knows what to do with because I would like interview him, make videos, build a whole channel on YouTube about do it yourself. And that's only, he, he would only win because nobody else in his, in his world is, is doing that. And like, it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't always have to be this like magical product thing that you invent. It's like, what's your wedge? Like if you're a, if you're a B2B SaaS company and nobody in your space has ever started a podcast, then that might be the, like the first thing that I would explore and I could go clean up because there's not, there's not like, um, Gary V has this amazing quote. And like, I don't care if you like or Gary hate Gary V, like he knows what he's talking about. And he has this quote that like he, he, he the number one strategy for him and the, their brands and anything in marketing is to find underpriced attention. And like, that's a huge opportunity. That, that is why like, it, it might seem silly, like all his stuff about TikTok, but if like, you're the only person in your world and can build a massive audience on TikTok, that's going to be a differentiator for yourself. Like if nobody in your industry has started a behind the scenes YouTube channel, like those are the, those are usually going to be the bigger opportunities versus like, well, uh, so what was your secret, Dave? Well, you know, we, we created this landing page and Benji's converted at 8% and ours converted at 10. And so we won. Like, <laughs> it's, it's going to be some, it's going to be some piece of some piece of the strategy. And so like, we're going to go intentionally do this first. Like um, I saw something recently from, from Cloudflare and they're launching like, because of it, be, like they're, they had a big field marketing motion and after COVID they needed to do something different. And so they're la they, they launched like 24 seven on demand TV channel that is people from their company, customers, whatever. And I don't know if that, I have no idea if that's interesting or not, but I love it as an idea because that's a, that's a bet that like might get everybody talking about you. And so in, in that world where you are, everybody is a commodity brand actually can be the one thing that, that separates you, especially in a world where like people just want to work with experts. Like I want to, I want to have the best person fix my car. I want to watch the best YouTube channel to figure out how to set up my home office. I want to get the best workout tips from somebody on, on Instagram. Like, that's true in any aspect of your life, whether you're in, you know, whether you're a carpenter, an accountant, a plumber, a marketer, people want to work with the best. And so like, if you started this agency to build websites, why? Like, did you yeah. first start fixing websites when you were 14? And like, you've been doing, even though you're only 28, you've now been doing it for 14 years. Like there's always a story there. It sounds like everything that you're saying boils down to just something really simple, which is 
survey the landscape of all your competitors and just find one thing that you can do different than what everyone else is doing. And it can be in terms of a feature, but it can also be marketing tactics or channels that no one else is focusing on. It can, it can be just anything that you think is really important to the customer. And then you can exploit that basically yeah. is what you're saying. Have you, have you ever seen this book, the high growth handbook? On Stripe. So, so this Stripe published this book. This is 300 pages, real interviews. Okay. It doesn't, but, but it's from, it's from Stripe press. Like they created a, 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 a publication, like, and they actually did a real book. Like that's an example of that. Instead of, instead of sitting around and say like, let's do webinars like everybody else. Maybe what if you spend a little bit more money and your big splash, this is not how they go to market, but it's just, it's just an example. Like, yeah. what, what if, what if you're that dev shop and you're like, you know, what? we're going to write a book and I'm going to publish that book and I'm going to give it away for free or, or whatever. Like it's it just, it's just about thinking like not, not thinking about in the weeds of like funnel optimization, but like, what are the things that are going to get people to talk about you? Right. Everybody, everybody like use Red Bull as a great example because they were like the first company to really do like kind of user generated content and these crazy stunts and turn that into marketing. They were just the first people to do that or, or dollar shave club that, that video, right? Yep. Now, if you make a video like that, it's like, Oh, that's a dollar shave club video. But they were the first people who are like, Hey, how are we going to compete with Gillette? Well, we're going to spend some like, and by the way, the other thing that's really important is like you have to use existing skills. And so like, if you, if you are not good on camera, then that strategy that you guys just talked about with the, with the website stuff, it's not going to be good because it's going to yeah. be hard for you to do. Like if talking is easy, like the, the, the Michael Dubin from, from dollar shave club, I think he was like a script writer or something like that, or had some film background. And so like he was able to bang out like a very funny and great script and go make a video about it and shoot it with his friends. Like I have done, when I went to drift, I had already done three or four podcasts. And so I knew that, Oh, I can start a podcast in my sleep. I, I know how to do it. I know what gear to get. I know how to do those things. Um, if my skill was video editing, then I'd be like, shoot, we should go start a YouTube channel. If you pick a channel and no like familiarity with it, with you're going to have to like, A, now you're doing March time as a company and B, you're doing something that you know that you're not comfortable with. You're, you're not going to, you're not going to succeed. Maybe you're a great writer. Don't start a vlog start a newsletter, like start with things, not only find the gaps, but when the gaps match what you can be good at. Yeah, no, that makes complete sense. Yeah, now it, now it kind of ties everything together because I think then going back to your statement about it, it starts with the founder. If I think even back to differentiation from an agency perspective and what we wanted to do with Grow and Convert, it was really from my personal experience trying to hire other agencies and realizing that most of them were just focusing on deliverables. It was like, we'll produce eight articles a month. And that was like all they cared about. And that was their whole sales pitch. And as an internal marketer, the question was, well, why aren't, why is there no focus on metrics or quality or how th this stuff is produced? And so when it came back to focusing on an agency and creating an agency, it was, well, every other agency that I talk to is just focusing on deliverables. Let's focus on results instead and let's write about how to generate results through content marketing. And that is the differentiation. Um, and, and so I can see now that I guess if a company isn't started with that focus of doing something differently, that that could be hard from, from a marketing standpoint because maybe there was real, no real purpose other than making money or something like that. Have you ever been in a situation where maybe there, there wasn't clarity from the founder and it was, and you had to kind of suss out what really differentiated it and not maybe shifted the product in a different direction or anything like that? I, I, I haven't, I, I've been, I've been lucky to, to be at the, like at companies where the founder really believes in marketing. Um, but do you I, join I do those companies like, on purpose then? Is that, is no, that like now, something you look for in a company? Now, no, now I, now I would earlier okay. in my career, I didn't have any control over that, <laughs> but, but yeah, okay. like now, whatever I do after this hundred percent, the first question that I'm going to ask is like, how, how, how does, how does the CEO think? Like, how does the CEO feel about marketing? And by the way, 
you can usually understand this without like, you can see this. If, if, if I was joining like an existing company, yeah, then you could see by how they do marketing or what they say or what the CEO tweets, like what they believe. Um, if, if it's a, if it's a brand new thing with not, nothing public, that would be like the first lunch that I have with that CEO is going to be about their philosophy on, on marketing and, and the company story. Um, and they have to be passionate about it, but it's your job as a marketer to get that story out of them. Like I, I think of it as like, you know, this is a skill that you could apply to anything. Hey, let's say Benji, you hired me to run your political, you know, Benji 2020. First thing I'm going to do is interview you and figure out who you are, where you're from, what you care about, what's unique about you. And like, you know, I just think like marketing has gotten so much into this automation stage where like, it, it is a little kind of been like Mad Men, Don Draper, like what's the hook? Like who, like, is anybody on your marketing team thinking about that? I don't think we are. I think we're just so deep in Google analytics and spreadsheets and whatever I always rant about, like who's finding the hook? Like let's, that, that's where the story, that's where the story comes from. Like, what's the hook? What is, what are we going to do here? The tactics are going to be easy. I can, I can go read your blog and figure out how to do and measure content marketing. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. Now that's really interesting. So now I want to tie it back to Privy then. So you leave Drift, you think about what to do for a while. Why, why Privy? Like what, what was the opportunity that you saw there? Um, either from a product perspective or a marketing perspective that makes you say, I want to join as the CMO and, and kind of repeat the success I had at Drift. It was like, it was 50% personal and 50% like market opportunity. Like I, I wish that I could say like, I just skated. I'm just a genius. I skated the puck where, well, where the puck's going. And I went to join a hot e-commerce company in, in the Shopify world. But I had known the founder. I'd known Ben, the founder for seven, eight years. I actually worked at Privy like eight years ago as an account manager when the company failed and ran out of money. We'd stayed really close. We felt like we were going to do something cool with that company and, and it never happened. And we just stayed in touch and you know, he'd be saying like, how can I get you to come back? And I'm like, I don't know one day. And, and so like it really, the conversation started off at a personal level with, which back to like the CEO stuff we just talked about. I knew that, I knew that as a CEO, I knew that he got marketing. I knew that he was excited about it. I would give him ideas and we'd talk about stuff and he would get fired up. And like, I knew that that felt really good. Um, and so then on top of that, it was just like, then it came down to the, the, the opportunity and, E-commerce is an amazing industry. I wanted to learn more about it. I wanted to get closer into the Shopify ecosystem. They had like a ridiculous growth without much marketing um, from going from like zero to seven, eight million in, in revenue in, in about two years. Uh, they had huge distribution through the Shopify app store. 500,000 people have installed their app. And so that's when my eyes lit up, which is like founder, CEO gets marketing, huge opportunity. They haven't really like, turn the megaphone on from a marketing perspective yet. And, and that was like, Oh, this sounds like a perfect playbook. And it's, it's also in an industry where like, I feel like I can be successful. Uh, it's marketing. Like I I've kind of always done marketing. And so now we're just teaching marketing to small e-commerce brands. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so then what did you do? So you, you joined the company, you see this opportunity in the e-commerce space. I, again, I, I think it's interesting because it's, it's another, you could argue commodity product. So I'm curious what the thought process is or what was the sequence of steps that you do when you join a new company? Um, if your goal is to, to build the brand. So here, same thing. Like it started off with an assessment and it's like, sure, there's lots of noise, but like there isn't one brand that owned e-commerce marketing. And so like Privy, the shift was like to go from an individual product company, like pop-ups and this, to, to platform. And in talking to Ben a lot, the founder, like we said, Hey, what's the thing you want to own? He's like, I think we could be the marketing platform for small e-commerce brands. Okay. So then you look around at all the other people, there's not a clear competitor in the space. There's a bunch of other companies that like kind of are related. Some of them are more upmarket. And so it became really obvious that like, Holy cow, there's a, there's a wedge here, which is like, we just need to show the world that we own e-commerce marketing. And so the very first thing that we did was launch a podcast for the reasons that I talked about earlier about like leverage. We wanted to, it's not even the sexiest name, but we said, Hey, let's launch the e-commerce marketing show because how can you be the leader? Like, Oh, this is the best way to show that we're the leader in this. We are the leaders in e-commerce marketing. We're hosting the e-commerce marketing show that drives the whole content strategy that drives everything that we do. That's how we get all the content. Now, all of a sudden, 
in a world where like there's kind of 20 different products that you might use before in the Shopify ecosystem. Now we're the ones raising our hands and saying, no, we're the leader in e-commerce marketing. Like, because nobody else had really had stepped up and said, this is what we own. And now the great part is from a marketing perspective, like this dictates our marketing strategy. Our, this is what our content has to be about. This is what our videos, our podcasts, our email, like this is who we have to be as a brand uh, and, and really tell that story. And then like, we already had some things baked in like, oh wow, they already have a ton of reviews. And so I can use that as social proof, but it was really like focusing in on, on, on showing that we're e-commerce marketing and we are for small, we are for small brands. There's a lot of people that do things in this space for bigger brands, but we said, Hey, we're for you zero to a million. Like this is who you want to come use to do your marketing. And that's how we kind of like worked our way backwards to find that wedge. You take from a feature perspective, something that seems so simple, like pop-ups and something that everyone else has done before. And then you, you, you turn it into, we're the best e-commerce marketing for small businesses. You got to you have to you have to elevate. Like I think if you can elevate the conversation about your thing, it's gonna do. It's gonna be. It's gonna be such a great thing for your for your brand, and like this makes it so we don't have to play in the like feature war. Like we don't have to battle. Like oh, your pop up does this versus our pop up does that. Like hey, we're we're priced where you can afford us. Like why don't you just buy the whole platform that you need for if you're gonna try to grow your brand. Yeah, that makes complete sense because it, it completely shifts the mindset because I would argue, okay, you do pop-ups. There's a million people that do that. You do, yeah. you do t text messages. Same thing. There's a million people that do that. But then now you're yeah. saying we're, we're the best platform to help you make sales for small businesses. And then these are just a couple of the ways that we do that. It almost shifts the mindset from focused on features and the nitty gritty about what this tool does versus this tool to now it, it, it just, it's almost like it is the feeling that you get that, Oh, I need to use these guys. Cause it's going to help me accomplish the goal that I want to achieve. Yeah. What I was going to say is the two mistakes that I was thinking of is marketers walking into privy that are not that, as opposed to how Dave did it and focusing on feature differentiation, which you guys are just talking about now versus the second one was, optimizing channels, which Dave, you kind of talked about, like everyone's thinking funnels, Google analytics. Cause I think that's what most people would do. They would walk in as a, as a mar marketing consultant to privy and be like, okay, what's working now. Okay. You're getting this many clicks from AdWords or Facebook and it's turning into this and your ROAS is that. So let's like optimize the landing page to make it even better. Or then feature differentiation be like our pop-ups we have, pop-ups plus flyouts plus this, and you only have pop-ups, right? Like, cause like that's, that's like an endless, like, cause it's just totally commoditized. Like, I don't know, yeah. how would you even win there? And you're just saying, I don't care. Privy is the marketing thing. It's so interesting. It's like, you literally, this is a so random, but it reminds me of this Tim Ferriss quote where he said, I'm always after this, what's the one decision I can make that makes the thousand other small decisions just go away. And that's kind of like this, like, I don't have to worry about all of my optimization of XYZ from a, from a channel perspective. And I also don't have to worry about how I'm going to fight this feature and then that feature and then that feature. And all of those have competitors. I don't have to worry about that. I make one decision and the rest of the decisions just go away, which is you're not differentiating that way. You're just saying, this is the, this is the leader in small e-commerce marketing period. We have an entire platform, like join us. Yeah. Like what, what you want to arm your sales team with and whoever is like, Hey, do, do you want to use the, the best platform for e-commerce marketing? We, we know this world best. If, if that doesn't sound like you, then that's fine. Like you should go check out the other stuff and you can run on your own. You know, same thing with Drift, right? Like elevate the conversation. Like, yeah, inter Intercom, great product, great business, probably going to go public soon. Great company. But if you want the thing that's built for sales and marketing, you should, you should try Drift. Like th that conversation gives you all the power. Here's one that I want to bring up because I think we talked a lot about how to find the promise. So you're saying we're the best platform for X or these people or we're the best at this. And I think a lot of people struggle with just that portion is just figuring out what differentiates them and what can make them a great but then and I think, I think the, they struggle because they're, they're not the best at anything. Can we just say that? Or is that like true? Right? 
Yeah. But but I think the other big challenge then is is even after you come up with the, the promise, how do you build that trust so that people really believe that you're the best marketing platform for e-commerce? Because I think another mistake that I often see is a lot of companies come up with these bold claims and say, we're the best at X or Y, but then the message falls flat because they aren't actually the best at that. And so I'm curious from your perspective, how do you, how do you build that trust and um, back up that claim? I mean, look, you got to have a good product. Like you have to have a good product period. And this is, this, this is why this goes beyond marketing. Like as the marketer, all I can do is, is walk you into our restaurant and get you seated. Right? Like somebody's yeah. going to have to cook, cook the meal and, and make sure that it's great. If the food happens to be great, then holy cow, I'm gonna crush it here. Like, <laughs> cause you can, you can deliver on it. Um, same way, like, so you have, like, that does matter. Like you could, you could hire me. We could bring the whole amazing, like be, build the best marketing team in the world. And you could market something that's not gonna deliver on the promise. And I forget, I forget where this is from, but like, there's a great quote, like, marketing is like oxygen marketing is also going to put you out of business fastest too if you're not what you say you are and so if i'm telling you that i'm the world's best web developer and you 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 hire me and i'm not guess what that review is going to say said he was the best web developer he's not right like so you have to deliver on that by the way the other thing that i wanted to mention is like you still have to be good at the spreadsheet funnel stuff uh, so like, I'm lucky to have an amazing team. Like I have an amazing, uh, a demand gen person who's like the opposite of me in the, like, he is the SEO guy. He is the landing page optimization person. Um, together we work really well. I just think in most cases you have to make the big splash from a positioning standpoint and then do the optimizing together. That's why, like, if you can get brand and demand cranking, they make each other's lives much better. Yeah, we've seen that firsthand uh, from the content side with certain clients where we have, we're ranking for the keywords, we're bringing in the traffic. And what we need is once they land there for them to be like, oh, this message resonates and this thing resonates. And Benji, we can talk about that afterwards, actually, to, t to tie it back in to like our course. Yeah, I think that makes a great place to end it. I, I think that kind of just ties the whole conversation together, unless you have any last parting words or things that you were thinking about that we didn't get a chance to ask you? That's pretty much it. I could talk forever about it, but you no gotta worries. find, I, I say like, number one is you gotta find, you gotta find the gaps, find the gaps in your, in your industry. Number two is like, then find where you can actually compete. And so uh, eventually, yeah, it would be great to start a YouTube channel, but I have no experience doing that. So I'm going to stick to what I know, which is like, I'm going to start a newsletter. Uh, marketing is a momentum game. And so the faster that you can get going with that stuff, like it's just gonna, you're gonna get the feedback loop faster. You're gonna test your message faster. You're gonna start to build an audience faster. Whatever you can do that's gonna get you out there sooner versus a lot of people will be like, a lot of people will listen to this and be like, totally get it. I gotta go hire a video person in a creative agency. And like, you know, next year we're gonna do it. We're like, no, I'm saying like, go, go start your newsletter tomorrow and just start writing and just get, get going. And you know, this, this can hurt me in some, in some cases, but I always try to launch something before it, before it exists. Cause I, I want to have demand. Like everything should be like a Kickstarter campaign. Like you should, you should be able to do marketing where you can generate demand before you launch the product. So, so you're going to succeed.